Buenos dias. Just a quick caveat on today's preview, which is the Coffer 2021 team preview. We recorded this about five to seven days ago, which we typically do for the uh, team 2021 preview podcast. And that was before the news came out that Elia Viviani uh, was diagnosed with a heart issue or a heart condition, and he's subsequently been checked out for that. And I think some good news came through today, actually, which I haven't looked through in detail, but apparently he, he expects to be back racing pretty soon. But in this preview, I guess we're a little bit harsh on Viviani and Cofidis particularly because he was their big signing in uh, 2019 for 2020. And we don't know, I haven't seen whether the this heart issue was the reason for maybe not getting as many race results in 2020. But yeah, we didn't know that at the time of recording the preview. So I wanted to put that caveat in there if you maybe thought we were being a little bit harsh, which we probably would have eased off on or at least applied that caveat in real time. Same issue or a similar heart issue happened with Diego Ulisi and hopefully he gets back to full fitness and racing soon for Team UAE Emirates. They seem to be very common in cycling, which is a shame, all these young men uh, and women, I guess, having these heart conditions. Uh, so I hope, hope Viviani gets better and I hope he has a bounce back 2021. I think he could go all right at the Giro. But anyway, that's enough from me. Check out Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast on Twitter account if you haven't seen it yet benji's put that together but otherwise hope you enjoy this preview welcome back to the lantern rouge cycling podcast with benji nice and this is our cofidis team preview they were a pro conti team in 2019 they stepped up to world tour level in 2020 probably a pretty difficult year to make that transition and yeah it was a difficult year for them not gonna lie we'll go through that <laughs> in a second uh we'll go through there their transfers, or maybe, sorry, we'll go through their wins in 2020, their transfers, the strongest riders, what teams we select for the various races, and probably what is a good season and a bad season for them. Uh, I guess they're called Cofidus Solutions Credits, so they've got actually two title sponsors. But I think that Kitty yeah. Solution is the explanation of Cofidus. I think um, it's right. like um, what the company does. Okay. I mean, it's an insurance company. And I think Cofidis, they should have stayed as a pro Conti team, getting into their, their results in 2020. Now, I know, I know a lot of the smaller races were cancelled and it was just the really top-level races that went ahead mostly. But still, before lockdown, there were a lot of those French races like Bessage, uh, et cetera, that went on. And it was a rough year for them two wins both at 2-1 level uh and both before lockdown i I believe so first one was la tropicale and mr bongo stage one with attilo viviani the only win from a viviani last year was the uh the brother atilio (laughs) and then the other one was tour de south maritima duvar stage one with anthony perez who's quite a solid rider actually a good breakaway guy i think for this year once again but the highlight for their year, apart from those two, were I think was Guillaume Martin. He also won Polka Dot at the Vuelta a España. I think he was unlucky not to get a top 10 in the uh, Tour de France GC. He came second in a, in a Vuelta stage and a smattering of loads of top 10s as well throughout that Vuelta. Third in a Tour stage. He was third in the Dauphiné, which is uh, a really good result for him too, and he was competitive in all the stages. Third in the Mont Ventoux Challenge, twelfth in Paris, and third in Fournardesh, and fourth in Royal Bernard Drone. So, so Guillaume Martin really cemented himself as just a, a quality rider. And Benji, guess what his pro cycling stats ranking was in twenty twenty out of every rider in the world? Top twenty five, something like that. Fifth, Guillaume Martin <laughs> accumulated <laughs> so many. UCI points and consequently PCS points that he was the fifth best rider in 2020 by the PCS ranking because he did two Grand Tours, Tour de France and Vuelta. He was competitive in a lot of those stages and he did like one, two, three, four other stage races. He did Liège. He still came 13th in that World Champs road race where he's a domestique for, Gu- uh, for Julien Alaphilippe, which I guess is no benefit to Cofidis. And he did well at races like Mont Blanc 2 Challenge, etc. So a really, really good season for Guillaume Martin, despite not getting the uh, the really big win in, say, the Tour de France or the Vuelta stage or 
even a one week race. Uh, but how do you assess their season in 2020, Benji? It has to be viewed as a disappointment, right? Yeah, it's pretty horrendous, we could say. I think the only thing that okay. lights it up a tiny bit is uh, <laughs> I think the only thing that lights it up a tiny bit is Guillaume Martin. He carried the team and its results, and that shows. And I think that's going to stay the same over the um, the next year because Guillaume Martin went from 2019 riding for Wanty Group Goubert as a talented youngster that might turn out to be a GC guy at a team to um, going to Cofferties and straight up being that GC guy that people wanted him to be. And to do that in a French team probably is amazing for the French fans. But also, he does it in a, a pretty spectacular fashion that he's not the rider that just sits at the back of the elite group and lets it flow a bit. No, no, no. Whenever he sees an opportunity to... Uh, launch and perhaps surprise the favorites like Monde Guol against uh, Roglic. He attacked he Roglic, attack with, yeah. yeah he with 800 meters, to go. meters to go or something. And I think what we commented there was that we don't think he has the self-confidence to wait for the sprint versus Roglic, which yeah. would probably not end up too amazing either, but he was really explosive there. So one could think that if he launches that attack later, then he might be able to get a better result that day. But all in all, I think he's gained experience over the last year. He's shown that he's up there when it comes to the climbers and he crashed at the Tour de France, causing his top 10 to be uh, to be gone. He would have been above Caruso, let's face it. Um, but all in all, I also think he's really good at one-day races and he was 14 at LBL. I believe he can get higher results there because the only reason he's 14th is because he can't sprint very well in a group and he was in a 10-man group. So... If he is not in a 10-man group, and perhaps with like three or four riders, that's a top 10. And I think he can do better than that as well. I'm not sure what he could do in the likes of a flesh and such, though. I, uh, I don't know that by heart. But all in all, his main weakness is quite simple. Time trial. We've spoken about it quite a few times on previous podcasts that there are climbers out there like a Landa, like a Cust, like a Flazov as well, you mentioned in... Uh, in the Astana podcast we did. And he's the kind of rider as well, Guillaume Martin, that just lacks so much when it comes to time trial. He's one of the worst in, in world tour, I would name. Oh, and really? That is what I see him at. I um I could be wrong in that, but I think for GC riders, he's one of the worst. He was 26 to plunge the Plange de but that's technically a mountain time trial, so yeah, but I don't also, really count that fully. No one after 20 was trying as well yeah like that's true <laughs> so 26 there isn't great when you are a climber um but yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll be interested to see maybe his his race program will be pretty straightforward for us to figure figure out this year on to covetous transfers so the big transfer last year and the, the big salary was elia viviani coming over from quick step to to covetous that obviously didn't work out as they wanted i mean I'm not. I'm not saying that he had to go and win multiple Tour de France stages to justify that price. Uh, I think it was over a million euro that he got paid, but he he didn't win any any race, and he did a fair few races. He did the Tour and the Giro, Eli Viviani, and the Giro had apart from Demar. I mean, Demar was competing against Sagan every stage, and Viviani wasn't even in shot. So I don't know what went on with Viviani last season. I've obviously been pretty critical of him. I think it was, remember Benji when he was sprinting, when he was like 15th in one of those Giro stages and he did a full-on 300-meter yeah. sprint to the camera? And when I saw that, I was like, that ain't that ain't correct. Yeah. What, That's not correct what, indeed. <laughs> what's going on there? So the thing, uh, what, what, the do you, what do you see get wrong with him? The thing I see is he he left the Koenig quick step and that was a team with one of the best lead outs in the world. Quite simple, that year he was having the best lead out in the world. One could argue that in 2020, the Koenig quick step's lead out is on the same level as FDG, Kupama, because Kupama just stepped up so much in, in previous year. But in 2019, the Koenig straight up best lead out in the business. Interesting. And Never heard that before. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> um, but, and I but think if you look at he brought Consani with him. 
or Sabatini with him, and he brought Consoni over from uh, UAE. So well, maybe they underperformed as well. I don't believe Consoni is the perfect lead out, to be honest. I think he is much more worth something when it comes to a bit of a harder stage with a sprint in the end. We saw that at, was it the Tour de France? I think it was on the Lyon stage, the yeah, one where uh, Sudan Kranderson ended up winning in the end. We saw him sprint to second in that group, if I recall correctly, behind Mezgec. Yes. And if we look at those kind of races that are pretty hard, where the group gets splintered a bit, but there's still a bit of a sprint happening, then Consoni comes into play. But when it comes to a lead-out role, I've never seen him as one of the riders that could be an amazing lead-out, really, because he just feels like he's a hilly sprinter, kind of. And that's how I see Consoni and Ossicelli as a lead-out. Sabatini, the problem with Sabatini for me is that I don't think he's up there with the best lead-outs if we are moving him into the Tour de France area. If you bring him to the Giro... And you don't have a Groupama or the Koenig lead out in 2021 in the Giro or something, then he's more likely to be effective. Because Sabatini just doesn't have the speed, the initial boost to get that train in front of the other trains. If in the last kilometer, last 400 meters, most likely then something goes wrong. And he would need to have been put in the ideal position already by the person ahead of him. And I think that's where the lead out of Kofidis lacks. The people that bring the lead out forward. Because Sabatini can stick himself up there and stay there, but he can't bring himself forward more. While I don't know who they put ahead of Sabatini to uh, bring the lead out up there with the other lead outs. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also Viviani. For a guy that was really good on the hills at the Kearney Quick Step, he was struggling a lot. Um, and it was only on the Champs Elysees stage, which is obviously very like the easiest stage in terms of overall TSS of the tour that he did quite well. I think he came fifth or something. Uh, so that was, I guess, their big gamble, Cofidis. They bet on Viviani, big signing, brought him over. And when they moved up from P- Pro Conti to World Tour, and I, I think that's the mistake, Benji, is that they are they are effectively a pro continental level team. They were the third worst world tour team. Arkea and Alperson had way more points than them last year, and the they've spent all that money on maybe the big marquee signing and then two lead out men for him, and then they've not really filled the team with quality riders in other senses. So, and another problem is. When you go World Tour, I said this on the Astana podcast, you have to go to every World Tour race, and that creates pressure on your, your program. Maybe you can't go to – remember, you, you guys might think we're being overly critical of Cofidis. Why are you ragging Cofidis for not you know, winning the Tour de France by 10 minutes or whatever? But they won 20 races in 2020 – in 2019, sorry. 2019, they won 20 races, and it was a lots of um, sort of – Second tier Europe Tour two one races, which you'd expect from the best or one of the better pro continental teams, and I'm not sure they were able to do as many of them or focus on as many of them. Uh, but anyway, let's get into their transfers for 2021. Out is Dimitri Clays, which I'm kind of surprised by. Uh, he was yeah. one of their better cobbled riders um i'm kind of surprised by that he came sixth in the tour of flanders like yeah, that's mad that's a, that's a very very good result and he was <laughs> he was up there too like he was in the the main group with with those guys and he's won like he won on loop uh u23 twice that like clearly like talented well i say talented he's 33 now but yeah i wouldn't i'm surprised that he got let go to be honest, are you like are you surprised? He wouldn't have been asking for a million bucks. Yeah, I'm not surprised that he might be the one that let the negotiations to go out, but I doubt that's the case because he signed up for Quebecer Assets in the end, exactly, which is that yeah. team that ended up being unknown to even exist until the latter parts of the transfer season. So that would mean that he hadn't signed a contract before that. And thus, either negotiations flopped or 
he was not being negotiated with to extend, which is just mad to think about. I'm going off scraps here. We're just thinking of what could be the possibility that he signed so late for another team. Um, yeah, perhaps he was negotiating with both teams and ended up choosing Quebec over it. Could all be the case, but he's definitely one of the riders that is very valuable and most likely underrated in that. And this is one of the things I want to mention is regarding transfers, you've got moving GC riders, you've got moving sprints, and you've got moving cobble riders, for example. It really depends on the discipline of what a team needs to do when getting a new rider. Dimitri Klaas in a cobble race at Cofidis, not much support. He got 16 Tour of Flans without too much support. The benefit of transferring couple riders over is that you don't necessarily need to build an all-out extreme team surrounding them to be able to achieve results with them. And Dimitri Kleis is a perfect example of that, that I think will be uh, worth something at Quebec Assos. And yeah, he's uh, also a friendly guy, so I guess that's a benefit as well. I think so that's in the uh, He would have been a yeah. nice nice combination with the guy they have brought in, Belgian uh, Yellow Valais, from... Lotto Sudal. He won Paris Tour twice, won Blasio of Landern, Paris Tour on the 23 as well. He's won a stage in the Welter in 2018. Uh, so he's a good. Was that the one where he shouted, uh, Where's Quick Step? Where's Quick Step now? <laughs> <laughs> so he's, a, he's again, he, like that would have been a nice combination. So I'm surprised they haven't linked them up. But anyway, maybe they think they can replace Kleis with Lollies they've brought in as well. Yempi Drucker, who is a sort of lead-out guy but also can sprint on his day. I think the Luxemburger for Bora Hansgrohe. Uh, he was at Bora Hansgrohe and he's come over to Kofidis. Maybe he's going to be in the Viviani lead-out train. Maybe he's going to go for his own sprints. Simon Geschke, stage hunter from the from CCC, has come over. I presume he'll be supporting Guillaume Martin and going for stages. Ruben Fernandez, very talented rider who... Showed a lot when he was younger and maybe hasn't really achieved his full potential. Come over from Uscatel Uscadi, and they've sent Luis Angel Mate to Uscatel Uscadi. He's an outgoing Tom Bowley, TT guy, not much on his Palmares either from UAE. Uh, Jimon Chagnoc from CCC, Remy Rochas from Nippo, Andre Calvalho from Hagen's and Axion, and Thomas Champion. I think he's probably pronounced champion. Champion. Yeah. We're going to call him champion. Champion. <laughs> it's come over from PCS says, doesn't know where he's come from. So I don't know whether he's got a U23 team or what. French elite team, most likely. Yeah, somewhere. 21 years old. Did Ronda Lizard. Got some decent results. Second in the stage there. So he could be quite talented. Maybe he, maybe he's ready to help already in the GC. On GC, Carvalho is 23 years old. Uh, no major results, but fifth in Paris Roubaix U23 and fifth in Liège U23 in 2019. So maybe he's going to be in their cobbled races. He's kind of, I think he's going to be more an Arden guy from his weight. And uh, I think like it's easier for lighter guys to do well in Paris Roubaix in U23, and it's not so easy up in World Tour level. But no one really moving the needle too much in my view uh with those signings so yeah what, what do you make of those signings benji any any ones that you think are low-key kind of kind of good uh i think sinoc is a, a good signing i think sinoc is the kind of rider that can get top five sprints in in the Velta if you set him up correctly he doesn't even need to have a proper lead out too much um he did it in 2019 if i recall correctly he uh got a few solid places in La Vuelta third in the Madrid stage, the last one. So um, definitely a decent sprinter. Simon Geschke and Drucker, those are the two riders that... Drucker most likely. Drucker feels like a rider that is definitely past his prime. And I don't like saying it, but I think a bit washed in, in potential opportunities and offering for the team. So I think what he could do for the team is being supportive for the youngsters, showing his experience and being part of the Cobble team, but they just lost Dimitri Kleis. So, yeah, that's your answer on that. Well, I, I don't know, he's a bit of a... He's been inconsistent in that area. I think he can be really strong, but it has to be on his day. He's more of the uh, breakaway guy with decent Cobble as well. He, um, 
He might be decent at breakaways and such. I don't really expect him to win anything too big at Cofidis either. Ruben Fernandez. Yeah, that that's that's a good rider. Like quite generally, it's a good rider. He gets like fifth in at Road Race National Championships in, in Spain, top tens in the likes of Valenciana stages, just top tens in in Spanish hill classics, and he can perform well, but. I think he's more likely going to uh, lean towards getting a KOM at a certain point or uh, fighting for a KOM, the likes that Herada is doing at Cofidis. And outside of that, the other riders, Champion, honestly, don't even know what he does. Um, we will get to know him over the season. So once we know, we'll tell you. Remy Rojas and Carvalho. Carvalho is interesting because he's a youngster from Egensbaum and Axion. Um they do send out one of the better amounts of talents, in my opinion, in the last few years. Uh, and I think he can do well, but I think we'll get to know him more over the season. Tom Bowley, time trialist, he was decent at UAE in La Vuelta 2019. He got a top 10 in, no, Giro, in Verona. I think he got the top 10. But outside of that, these are not the signings that will move the needle, like you say. And um, that's one of the things I notice in comparison with transfers from these teams compared to the bigger teams, is that the bigger teams tend to focus on trying to get youngsters in their squad for the future, while these lower teams try to may take a sh- cheat shortcut with getting the likes of a Viviani just past their prime, or, well, at his prime when they, when they got him at that moment. And I think that's where these teams perhaps make... I'm not sure it's a mistake, because... The bigger teams are going to no, get it, more young it, talent in their team. Do you have given Viviani like 1.4 million euro? I would not, but on the other end, they would have expected him to at least win one Grand Tour stage, and he got nowhere near that, so he completely underperformed compared to what the team was expecting, even uh, even a little bit. And even if it's not the top races, like you said earlier, he won nothing, and he raced a lot of times in and 2020. Viviani's not just, he, he's never been just a pure Grand Tour sprinter either. He's won three ducks at Brugge de Pana. He's won the Ride London Surrey Classic. He's won Cadell's. He's won Britannia Classic. He's won the uh, Hamburg Classic. He, he's like been a prolific winner in some seasons, um, but... Yeah, just something was wrong in 2020. And let's get now get into what we expect for 2021 and what teams we'd send to various races. Let's start with the Cobble Classics. I think it's pretty pretty obvious to me. It'll be Yellow Valais, Kenneth Van Bilsen, Piet Allegard, and Laporte, maybe Sabatini. I don't know. It's not... Not the strongest. I think Lalais and Ben Bilson are their strongest there. Who else do you think they'd send to cobbled races? I think the names that you mentioned are definitely the ones that they most likely will be sending. I put Olegard as one of the stronger ones. I think he was 30 for something at Tour of Flanders. Um, so he's definitely got it in him. He could perform better over the years. He's 25 now. And um, that's definitely near the age of becoming into the prime of their career. And um, he's Belgian, so Evenepoel is still a, an exception here. Usually we peak at around 27. I'm not there yet. I'm getting there in about four years. So uh, you might see me at the Tour de France by then, but I doubt it. <laughs> Mate, when you look at... I mean, I know I'm, I'm just interjecting with a random thought. When you look at... And, and I'm sure he's, not, he's a nice guy, right? The fact that they're signing Hugo Tamir... Uh, like a 20-year-old, 19, 20-year-old yeah. French guy, trainee, three-year three, three year deal at Cofidis at World Tour level. There is no fucking way this guy <laughs> is as good as Biniam Germay. Like, not even close. He, yeah. Biniam Germay is like different level rider this guy, and he can't get a World Tour contract. And that's why I always have people like, oh, you're too harsh on the smaller teams. They don't have the budget. They can't compete with the bigger teams. It's like, well, are you sure they can't do better, though? Like, there's 
there's so many signings I looked at they make in this team, and I'm like, just get rid of like four of them. And I know you've got to fill a roster, but there are talented guys you can go out and get who are still at pro Conti level. Mikel Ryan Benji, he, he would be first on the team list at this team for a lot of those Cobble Classics, right? Yeah, and he'd also be um, the best sprinter on the team if Viviani doesn't win anything in 2021 either. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, so you can say we're harsh all you want, but there are riders out there that you don't have to be a genius to look at. I mean, okay, maybe Nippo paid Gurmai well and we don't know the terms of that deal and I've banged on about it too much. But Nico yeah, Ryan's but... literally out of contract. He's been asking yeah. for a contract for <laughs> like four months, three months. Yep. And he would solve a lot of, I feel, of, of an important gap in this team. You can send them to five worlds. Trobro, Trobro Leon, Britannia Classic, Parry Tour. Pair him with Yellow Valais, Ban Bilson and Co. And that's like a pretty half decent team that you'd be like, these guys could pull something off in one of those races. So I don't know. I've, I, had to go, I had to get the rant out about the Cofferdis team. Uh-huh. I completely agree because I think that some of the um, area of scouting of these World Tour teams is just not really up there sometimes. And it's the lower World Tour teams. You Obviously, you've got the big guns that get in the big talent from uh, from afar. But really, Gidemai should be in World Tour right now. And we've said it quite a few times on this podcast. I think that, in general, we have a feeling that they tend to sign riders more that come from their own youth teams, the likes of a Cofidis and the likes of an Arche Desert, and that often brings in young French riders that aren't up to standard with World Tour, and instead they should look at it's same with same with Trek, Trek with the Italian guys. Yep, uh-huh. exactly, exactly the same situation. So, and, and I'm not saying like, you know, Confidence actually have a, a fairly good record of signing uh, like African riders, like Berane is on the, not now Berane is on the team. Um, but yeah, I just, I just need to get that rant out. So, Cobble Classics, we've said Milano, San Remo, Benji, who's going to be their leader? Is it Viviani? <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, <I think> it- <laughs> he won't get over the Poggio. Like, there, there's no capability of that, in my honest opinion. I would be uh, shouting more for Consani than Viviani there, but uh, they don't have a rider that can follow any big ad- attacks on the Poggio unless they send the likes of Guillaume Martin. But Guillaume Martin, if he attacks or follows someone attacking on the Poggio, he's either getting caught solo afterwards or he's going to get out sprinted in the end. So the likes of a Martin will most likely not be starting the likes of a. Uh, Milano San Remo. Christoph so, Laporte. Uh, yeah, he's actually a good a good pick for you, to be honest. He could he could do that. He could yeah. get over that hill and and make it happen, get, but he, he hasn't done it yet. Game. He's twenty eight, he, he could get a, top 10 in San Remo. It's possible. He got he yeah, came but he got hundred in in twenty twenty. <laughs> he came thirteenth in twenty eighteen. I think Oh okay, yeah, yeah. One rider who like, showed a lot of potential and has won a lot of races previously, Nathan Haas, the Australian. He's 31 now. He came like fifth in Amstel or fourth in Amstel, Benji, in 2018. Yep. And like on paper, he should be that guy who's actually really good in Milano San Remo if they do the climb hard and it's a reduced bunch. Stage in the Tour of Amman 2018. Sorry, it was fourth in Amstel in, in 2017 that, that Haas got. And that was, I think, behind Gilbert Kwiatkowski and Albacini. So. Like pretty good company, but yeah, he didn't really hasn't really shown much in in twenty twenty. He didn't come uh, top ten in any stage except in Santos two and under. He came third before lockdown, but after lockdown was pretty anonymous. Um, so I think it feels he, like yeah, gone. It feels like his it feels like his second season at Katusha kind of broke his career regarding potential opportunities of taking victory. Yeah, he he did get like third in Santa Sota and understage to Sterling, but that's one result. And with one result in a year, you won't make it. And yeah, it looks like 
the change between 2018 and 2019 is what made the real difference in his career. And he's now 31. I don't feel it, I fully believe that he's going to reach a potential or the peak that he was when he was 28 or 29. And therefore, I, I just don't believe too much in Nathan Haas anymore regarding offering opportunities for victories in any big races. Small races, sure, he can he can do well, but I don't see too much happening there, honestly. So that's their Milano San Remo team, possibly as Viviani. And then Ardennes Benji, Guillaume Martins, the leader, the Harada brothers, Geshka. I think it'd be all right. Fernandez helping them as well. Uh, who else would you send to to the Ardennes? It's got to be Guillaume Martin as the out and out leader, right? Yes, and definitely for LBL. He got 14th in LBL in 2020, and I believe he can do better there. The only problem for him is we've said it a few times already. His time trial was a problem for GC, but for these kind of races, his problem is his sprint. He got into a group, the second group in Liège Bastogne Liège, and he ended up being second last in the group. So that brings him to 14. While if he had any decent sprint level, which is weird because in hilly sprints, I feel like he has something to offer. We've seen it quite a few times already. Again, Mont but also that French national championship that Bargill won where Guillaume Martin got second or something. Something like that. I recall something in history regarding that. So it's not like he doesn't have a punch, but he doesn't have the sprinting group, it seems. Yeah, there seems to be a difference between those two qualities uh, on his end. And next to him on those races, yeah, the likes of Herada and such could go there as well. Ruben Fernandez, their new signing, could go to the uh, to the uh, Hill Classics for sure. Simon Geschke would be in there for me, Nathan Haas. They've got a, a pretty complete team able to uh, send to those races. And I believe they can achieve pretty good results with those teams, honestly. Yeah, I think a top 10 for Guillaume Martin at Liège, Boston Liège, is certainly on the cards. But Amstel and co, he, he doesn't have the punch for races like Amstel, I don't think, or even Flesh. I don't think he, I think he'll struggle with that pure sprint compared to like Woods. Alaphilippe, Dan Martin and co. Maybe he gets top 10, but yeah, it's t- it's tough for them in those races too. Giro d'Italia, I think they're going to centre around Viviani Benji. I think they're going to try and get stage wins there with, with him. I think that's the right move, and I hope that he can come back and get some good results there. I think it's going to be easier for him there than in the Tour de France. I think he's going to be more comfortable in the Giro. I think he should be going for the Ciclamino. I know Ewan is going to the Giro, he says, so that's that's trouble for yep. Viviani. Uh, I don't think it's, it's not going to be – I think it's going to be a stronger sprint sort of uh, – I know Demar was dominant, but I think it's going to be a, a deeper field of sprinters next year in the Giro. I think Guillaume Martin is going, obviously, to the Tour de France. And do you think he'll go for GC or – He must. He must. No, he's not going to go for stages or a jersey. I'd be really disappointed if he doesn't go for GC. He was almost top 10 this year. Obviously, limited time trial kilometers, but he also crashed and lost about four or five minutes there. I think he'll be better than 2020 in 2021. I think he's gained a lot of experience in just being leader for a squad. And he's also one of the riders I'm kind of rooting for. I um. I like Guillaume Martin. I think that in the Tour de France, he could get a top 10 this year, and I think that should be his goal for this. He's in a French team. They're going to want them to go for GC, and that's he's gonna, he might end up in a bit of a Bardet feeling from this point onwards in his career, that he's going to be uh, force-fed to go for GC in the Tour de France, but he's also a French rider on a French team with GC capabilities. So I think it's a must, Tour de France, GC. I think Col de la Lose is higher than the altitude. Is that higher than Port de l'Anvara that they're doing next year in the Tour? Uh, anyway, he lost four minutes on the Col de la Lose stage on Lopez. So I don't think altitude is his forte, whereas unlike Ossia Malet and uh, Laurent, he came top 10 in those stages. So, yeah, he Puy Marie as well. Did he crash on Puy Marie, Benji? Because he went from third on GC 
down yep. to 12th. Is that when he crashed? He crashed on the hill before Pumari, and he had to try and climb back before they got to Pumari. By the time okay. they got to Pumari, it was, uh, it was all over. Okay, so it seemed like the altitude stage and the crash really cost him even getting a sixth on GC in the tour. So, yeah, I think you're right. He'll be going for GC there. Uh, is Viviani targeting the Olympics as well, Benji? I don't know if that fits. Do you think it fits? Vivi, Elia Viviani on the track. The track was all right. Isn't yeah. he doing the track? Yeah, indeed. If he does, I think he was focusing on Olympics. He should do track indeed. I, I was forgetting about track for some reason. But you're, uh, you're damn right. He will likely uh, go there and, and focus on track. The thing with these riders that also focus on track is that Olympics is their thing because world championships happens obviously but in that area in the track business olympics is still like steps higher above world championship i think and because of that definitely he must yeah like it, kind, it kind of feels like a must for him <laughs> so i think he'll be i think viviani right now will be like my main goal for this season is track gold and <laughs> confidence to be like thanks uh <laughs> But I think that's the reality of it. Uh, yeah. Gio Martin, I think, Carinisi says he's doing I, – I, I think he could win a one-week race. I think a good re- result to him would be winning a one-week race somewhere. Now, I don't know which one is – whether it's Tour de Lain or Tour de Zelf, Maritima Duvar, or maybe even he gets another podium at Dauphiné if, if it all lines up for him. I think he's better at the one-week hard – GC races than a full Grand Tour, to be honest. Um, but otherwise, do you think set, we should probably say who they'd fill out the roster with? We won't, shouldn't just speak about Viviani and uh, Guillaume Martin. Resending to the, the Tour de France, I think they'll also be sending Anthony Perez, Pierre-Luc Perrechon, maybe Remy Rochas, uh, the young 24-year-old, Nicolas Ede, the veteran Geschke, and then Vuelta, the Harada brothers, uh, Fernando Bartello, Barane might go to the tour or the Vuelta, Andre Carvalho, yeah, perhaps. Um, I think that this team has a real problem regarding filling up all three Grand Tour spots. They're obviously going to be able to because they've got enough riders, but I think that this is going to be a situation where if Gil Martin rides a tour, he's also going to ride the Vuelta because. They just don't have anyone to focus on on the Vuelta. If they send Vivani to the Giro and Martin to uh, to the to the front, so I think we're gonna see an overlap between Grand Tours here. I think Martin's gonna ride two Grand Tours in twenty twenty one. I think Sinok might might sprint in one of the uh, one of the Grand Tours as well. All in all, it's you not know, the strongest team, and you know, Martin does not have the strongest support. Sorry. You know who's going to win a Vuelta stage next year? And Simon Gashke. No, write it down. Okay. Emmanuel Morin, 25-year-old French driver. Oh, he was a sprinter, right? Came sixth in Madrid. He's, I think he could just get win, win like a random Vuelta stage. I think <laughs> it's possible. I, no, seriously, yeah. though, I think he could win a couple of races next year if, if, he, uh, if things go his way. You know, he should be peaking in his sort of development at 25 as a sprinter so yeah maybe he could go well next yep. year but i Good think goal. it's hopefully they pick the right races to send riders to it does hinge a lot on guillaume martin but benji what is a good season for cofidis what's a par one and what's a disappointment mm, top eight in a grand tour would be uh would be what i would be calling for for guillaume martin why top eight because i think top 10 feels like a bit of a a goal that should be doable for Martin, and therefore he should strive a bit higher to make it a good season. Viviani needs to win races, <laughs> plain and simple, world tour races. If not, he's not worth it to have in that team. And it's as simple as that. He's being paid to win races, and he's not doing it, so he's underperforming, and he's not good enough for the team that he is, or the contract that he's riding on. So... If he doesn't win a single race in 2021, they got to get rid of him. And uh, <laughs> that sounds awful, but it's kind of true. Like, 
he's not offering them anything in 2020. He's gonna he he like we said, he might focus completely on Olympics for his track record. And if that is the case, he's not gonna give too much for this million dollar contract that he's on. So yeah, Gil Martin is what it hinges on, and I think Gil Martin is going to uh perform really well. I think he's going to top ten. Mm, I think we would be looking at at least 10 victories to make it a decent season. I would be aiming at 15 to make it a good season. They've got quality to win in smaller races. And a team like Kofferdus should also compete in smaller races. So uh, that's my yeah. take on that. I think 15 would be good. I agree with what you said about Guillaume Martin. I really judge them on the races that they should be being competitive in, which is the Trobro Lyon, the Paris Tour, those sort of races. I'd really like to see them fielding strong teams there. Dwarz Tour had Hageland with some of the Belgian guys they've got on the team that suit those races. So hopefully they pick up a few wins there. I think it is so hard when you're up going up to World Tour, but you have sort of the same squad you did the year before pretty much, and it's going to still be difficult in 2021. Can Guillaume Martin improve? Maybe, but I think there's other riders improving quicker around him. Vlasovs, Danny Martinez, Kamner, they're all coming in that sort of uh, style of rider too and are improving quicker. But I still think Guillaume Martin can get a couple of big results for them. Uh, I think 10 wins is about right, but I'm going under 10 wins for Kofidis in 2021 and Guillaume Martin leaving in 2022. Well, he's out of this is his last year on his contract, and I'd be I'd be snapping him up if I was one of the bigger teams, uh, to be honest. So that's our Kofidis wrap up. Any last thoughts on them, Benji? Do you think we've been too harsh? Uh, why don't you give an example of a team with maybe? I mean, we don't know their budget. That's the thing. Maybe they they got no budget, and it's impossible for them to compete. But I don't know, the Viviani signing was <laughs> kind of counters to that. What's yeah, an example indeed. of a team doing it better, in your view, on a smaller budget? Uh, let me open up the team page for a second here. I think that one of the teams that would be pointing at doing better with a smaller budget was Sunweb last year. But Sunweb last year also focused on a lot of youngsters and had a lot of youngsters in their team to end up overperforming. I don't think Kofidis has that at the moment. That's what I said earlier. These these lower end teams in UCI World Tour, once they reach World Tour, Antomaché is making a bit of the same issue in my opinion, but we'll get to that on the Antomaché pod. I think that these teams try and take shortcuts and transfers by getting big, more experienced guys on a higher contract, while they might be better off focusing on spending more on youngsters that will perhaps evolve into better and better riders that do well for them because Sunweb did it last year, stuff like that. And I think Coffert is... What, sorry? I'll give you another team. Arkea Samzi, okay. 12 wins. They also yep. signed right. a, a big big name rider, Quintana. I presume he's on seven figures as well. But I think... You got to. My view is that sprinters are like running backs in the NFL. If you don't have the best guy, then it's GC riders are kind of similar. But if you don't have the best guy, don't overpay for sprinters. They have like running backs a yep. shorter window. Their bodies get banged up. They get hurt by crashes. I'm just talking about the, the reality of it. And you're better off paying less for someone like Nasibuani, who can still pick up four wins for you. One at to pro level uh, in 2020, and I thought he was really good, Buani. And that's what I think these teams should be doing is trying to select riders like that. Um, and, yeah, he had a really good year, Nasu Buani, and you take that over, I think, or well, you definitely would take it over Viviani's year. So that's my view on on signings. I think Arkea do a – it did an okay job, not perfect either. I think they did get a bit unlucky with uh, Quintana as well. He had a good first half of the season. Uh, he still got, they still picked up a World Tour race, apparently stage seven. Um, but he, he got he had that injury as well, and he's 
I don't know how he's going to go in 2021. But we'll talk about that in the RK Samzik preview if we do one because they're still pro Conti unless they're World Tour in 2021. But that's all from us on the Cofferdus preview. Let us know your thoughts down below or on Twitter or wherever. We've obviously got the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast Twitter now where you can ask us questions and at us so you don't need to use the hashtag LRCP. You can if you want, but at us at the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast on Twitter for any questions, disagreements, or you can write it down in the YouTube comments down below. That's all from us. We'll see you shortly with another preview. Ciao.